The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure we welcome Michael Nesmith, or as he is known to many of his fans, Nez. Mr. Nesmith is a singer, a great songwriter, producer, director, author, recording artist, and entertainer. In addition to his work with the rock band The Monkees, Michael Nesmith has recorded and released more than a dozen albums, and his songs have been sung by some of the greatest singers of our time, from Linda Ronstadt to Andy Williams. Michael Nesmith and the First National Band are going to be performing in California October 2nd in Santa Barbara, October 3rd in Los Angeles, and October 5th in San Luis Obispo. Okay. So, so, Mr. Nesmith, we're happy you're here. Thank you for being here. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. How are you today? Uh, another day. <laughs> <laughs> another one. Another one bites the dust. <laughs> Speaking of these concerts that you have coming up in California, for you, what is it like the moments before you take the stage? Well, I, I, I mean, I don't. I may not understand the question because the answer to the question you just asked is sort of the same as the moments before. You know, I don't, I don't really ride these waves of uh, emotional uh, depressions or ecstasies or anything like that. And getting ready to go on stage is really more like just suiting up for a for an intense professional uh, athletic game. Hmm. Is there anything you do? Is there any ritual before you go on stage? No, not really. I, I, um, I'll take a few minutes, get in touch with uh, whatever is out there that's leading me and talking to me, and see if I can get a, a sense of its origin and a sense of its purpose, and then and whether or not it's an idea that I feel like uh, using. And and if I do, then I will. If I don't, then I won't. <laughs> I had the pleasure of seeing you in concert at the Variety Playhouse in Atlanta. And it was a very interesting, very unique way that you do your shows. There's a presence, a delivery. I loved the way you set up the songs. You would you would paint a little portrait with words and then go into the song. How did you develop the style, the way that you do your shows? Well, that that aspect that you're talking about right now is uh, the way the way that I I uh, present the music has always been sort of the same. It dawned on me at one point, though, that I was leaving a lot on the table, leaving a lot, you know, unplayed and un, unsung, and so I wanted to find out how to do it because what was ba- basically left out were these complex ideas that. Uh, usually center themselves around relationships that we've had with our with our wives and and husbands and our families our children our their children our grandchildren all that stuff and so i don't know how to put it it's 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 a uh, i'm trying to avoid saying every show is different but uh i don't think i'm going to be able to do that because they are and you have to uh give the show a minute or two in the first song to let you know what uh, what ski run you're going to slide down, and it's a it's it's a it's a moment of stillness, moment of quiet, quietness, and then it dawns on me what I'm supposed to do, and then I'll I'll follow that in. The songs that you heard sung with a little bit of a background were songs that I had made up, not no not songs uh, were introductions that I had made up that were that went to the parts of the songs that were unexpressed. And so I had to make those up too, you know, I mean, you can't, <laughs> it, it doesn't, ju- they aren't printed in the, those, those moments are not printed in the back of a magazine or it's not the sort of thing you can get off the back of a, a food box. You have to um, really reach into the substance of the words. And then once the words log in your head, then you can go on and sing the love song or the, uh, cautionary tale or whatever it is that you're that you're bringing forward 
that thing has to be set first in my head. And, and I realized that by doing the uh, movies at the mind, that what I was doing was I was giving the audience an opportunity to follow along with me doing that. Now, having, having said that, you know, it all sounds winning, you know, winning and we're in, we're in great shape, but actually it didn't work all that well. Um, I'm, I appreciate your kind words about it, but up on stage, I would find myself adrift from time to time, either a sudden spurt of laughter or a, a moment of uh, intense emotion that made me cry where I couldn't sing <laughs> and just ways of putting songs over that would reach the people that were had come to hear them. And by the time I'd gotten to the um, Atlanta show that you're talking about having seen, I was uh, well into a tour then. Um, I don't know, I made 10, 15 dates that saw that Atlanta show at the at the end of everything. And by that time, I was I was pretty well set in as the tour and the audience was pretty well set in to just uh, be still and, and attentive. I'm not sure, I'm still not sure that that's the best way to do it. But it's a little, also a little self-referential for me to be talking about it like this. And, you know, it's because if it's very personal and it's very, um, very much to the sensibility of the song. And that song, that songs, they're all different. So you just have to uh, learn them and present them as a presenter. You know, it, it, it adds an, an, another element to the uh, song writing and the and the song playing is any of this making sense yeah to you? yeah it does. okay good 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 <laughs> i remember walking out of the the venue the variety playhouse that night and even though i had listened to so many of your records i don't know why but i had never thought to categorize them as kind of country western oh uh-huh. <laughs> but they feel like that how would you categorize the songs that you write? Well, you know, you, you have to start with, one has to start with the poetry. And the poetry tends to not be particularly cultural, and it doesn't seem to be stuck in a, in a, in a time or a, or, or a culture where it says, you know, this is what this song is about, where it's from, it's why, you know, this is about the early sugaring off of the maple uh, maple sugar and maple syrup people it's it's more than that it's so much more than that although in those early moments of a of an enterprise like making maple syrup lives are formed that's that's where we you know the the, the rest of our lives come from and so it's all worth a, a very serious look I don't want to get too ponderous on this thing because it, it it really is not as ponderous as all that. It's more like it's more like sitting at a grandparent's knee and having them uh, regale you with some funny stories. This summer up at the lake, Bobby did this, and we all laugh about it to this day. Those are all good good fun, but you know, marking the passage of a of a death or marking the passage of something, you have to leave that to people on their own. They'll make their own decisions about it. And anyway, the songs are not designed for that. The songs are designed to uh, to show the story that's behind the song, not so much a narrative story. You know, Bobby went to town, bought a pair of earrings, brought it back, thought Rebecca would go to the prom with him. And sure enough, she did not because she was in love with uh, Rachel. <laughs> and it's you know, you you just never know where you're going to get to out there. <laughs> Who would you say has been the biggest influence on your singing? Well, I, I, I started off I started off with as just a dead comic mimic of uh, Dylan's style. I thought Dylan was is a great folk singer, and uh, he has um, a way of delivering either an austere or an arcane or an unusual kind of message to the songwriting, the songwriting foundations. And, and so it, it, it uh, it's different. I, I hate to do this. You know, it's different for every song. I mean, they're, they're apt for certain circumstances and not apt for others. So I stay away from favorites and just look for the ones that are going to crystallize a moment and um, bring it forward so that it, be, you know, it turns into one of the stories of the lives of the, uh, patrons 
as I was mentioning at the beginning of the interview, some of the singers that have covered your work, Linda Ronstadt to Andy Williams, but we could also say Susanna Hoffs, Carrie Underwood, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Frankie Lane. I mean, there was a lot of them. Was there ever an interpretation that surprised you? Well, of course, Linda's first interpretation of a different drum where she turned it into a ballad. Actually, I think the guy that was in the the Greenbrier boys who took it to her, a guy named John Harold, he's no longer with us, I understand, but but he had taken a, a country, kind of bouncy country ballad and turned it into this uh, uh, plaintive lament of two people who couldn't really get together because they were separated by time and, and circumstance. So that was uh, that was a great way to see that song come to life was when Linda slowed it way down and sang it in her beautiful voice with all the pathos and the and the uh, and the the thoughtfulness of it. And I think she really put something on the song that uh, was, um, you know, a a kind of decorative touch that was was unexpected and really delightful to me. I thought she she made the song more than it uh, started out to be brought it home in a way that was, you know, really beneficial for everybody. If you were fantasizing, who do you think would have or could do an especially good version of one of your songs? Has there been anybody on like a a wish list? Well, no, not really. I First of all, I think that may be a little untoward. I, it's, it's not my my metier to you know select performers of of songs that I write because I write them as a gen- a generalist pieces they're about something you know lost love lost uh, opportunities or amazing and victorious wins and so forth and and they uh, you know the songs have got to stand on their own and deliver those those messages so they, so I, I, I pointed, you know, I, I put the history of the song and the background of the song and the story of it and the narrative, if there is any, and put it back into the song where it belongs. And I try to render it from the point of view of the, of the singer who has uh, found courage or who has found a, uh, a way through a very difficult situation or a way, you know, to, to learn to fly. With your band, is there a certain mood that you like to set amongst all of you, like with your interactions, both on stage and off stage? Well, I think if, if there's one overarching thing, it's the uh, it's a sense of the circus and a sense of clowns and a sense of the the gaiety that goes along with a circus. And it's um, uh, you know, circus have lost their way these days, and so you can't really find what I'm talking about anymore. But there was a time when when the circus delivered these moments of life, points of life, and you could you could depend on it, even if it was trivial, you know, it was it was frivolous. You could still get at something, you know, uh the older brother going off to war, the younger sister going off to family building. This is of course times of the song of uh, that they were written. It's not that way particularly now. But back in the day when it was written, uh, you know, people were working out, is this relationship going to last for 50 years? Is the song going to last for 50 years? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, unanswered questions when that song first gets sung and puts its ideas out there. But as the author, it's a it's a hoot. I love watching the song mature and develop into something that uh, you never expected. Would you say that there's a spiritual aspect to your music? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a spiritual aspect to all music, you know, whether it's uh, dark and foreboding or whether it's uh, jolly and, and light is, you know, that's up to the lyrics and it's up to the uh, up to the author and up, up to a lot of things. When I write a song, I write it from the spiritual perspective. What are the spiritual ideas that are operating here? How are people making sense of something like this? A tragedy or maybe just a heartbreak. I say just a heartbreak. You and I know that the 
Nothing can be more painful than a heartbreak. And so getting these ideas to the to the people in, in the way that they're supposed to be there is, has become a little bit of a chore, but it's it's uh, it's satisfying when the audience gets it and you get a lot of approbation, people coming up afterwards saying, that, I never realized the song was about that or I never understood what a what a treasure I had in this song to deliver me from evil and et cetera, et cetera. And that's when you know you hit pay dirt. You don't get too many of those. You get one or two and you get a thumbs up here and there and a and a happy wave and a smile. And so you have to live on those things between songs and between their performances, which I do. I mean, you learn to do it. You have to live very frugally and, you know, just lightly touching down like a bird on a lemon tree branch. And, and there's a, there's something to that very delicate weight that's put on that says, look, I understand this moment and I want to sing you something about it because this moment foretells itself. And I think you'll see something in this song where you can get an idea of the way forward for yourself. And not that that's got to be a happy thing. Sometimes it's not a happy thing. It's arduous and difficult and so forth. So these are not life lessons. They're not like, uh, well, if you'll just give her a call and apologize, she'll be okay. If you'll just tell him you're sorry that you scratched whatever it was, you know, your forgiveness is at hand. You can find it. Find that forgiveness between the two of you. Then it'll it'll come right. And sure enough, that happens. But it's it is not engineered. It's built into the uh, the songwriting, which I guess maybe is a way of saying it is engineered. But it's not uh, it's not you know you, 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 I'm not trying to make something happen. It's trying to unpack the song in a way that what is in there does happen spontaneously and naturally. How's that sound? Hmm. Interesting. You've written with a number of people. Who would you say taught you the most about songwriting? Well, I haven't really written with that many people, but I take your point. Uh, I've been in the presence of some really fine writers. And, you know, people who just charge from one rhyme to the next really don't quite get the knack of what songwriting is about or just poetry writing. You you, you want an, an idea to begin to flutter above the body of the song and look for a place to land it, to put it so that people who are singing or listening or whatever suddenly hear it contextually in a way they can say, oh, I see, I understand, all is well, or all is worse than I thought. And, you know, you put together things like that that uh, make a song come together, and then the song's songs themselves come together and pretty soon you have an evening's worth of show. And if I do my job right, there's enough distance between the listener and the song writer to say these songs, uh, you know, you can, you can unpack easier if you just take it slow and listen to what they're saying. And sure enough, you know, people come back to me and say, I did what you said. And I have a whole nother use for the way these songs play in my life and I listen to them now in the car and on a on a playback at my home and so on and so forth and, and it comes into um they land in a nice place that you can use them even if they're not necessarily being performed if it's just you know a recording playback would you say that there was a life lesson or a biggest thing that you learned from your time with the monkeys Well, you know, people have, uh, have talked to me about this, and, and I have this catch phrase, and you'll hear it as a catch phrase because I haven't figured out quite the right way to say it. But what the essence of the idea is, learning by experience is the worst possible way to learn. I figured that out, and I'm not sure it's 100% true, <laughs> but I think it is. I think it's mostly true. Because if, if if what you're doing is charging at something and breaking it down and trying to get its constituent parts and then seeing how they work together and then, then reconstructing it so that people who are there to listen to those parts dance, then 
you know, you don't, you haven't quite got it yet. People, people have not uh, understood it. But if you look for it, you'll find the occasional song of light out there in the audience. And, uh, you know, it may be just behind the look in the, in the deeply contemplative eyes of someone who, who's trying to work out some of these emotional ideas of, uh, why did she run off with that guy? Or what? what's so alluring about this woman that I can't take my mind off of her? Those sorts of things. We're solving those problems all the time. And what I hope that the songwriting does is provide a, a way for those songs to reconcile and to provide something into the life of the listener that says, oh, I see. This is not about me, it's about her, or it's not about her, it's about him, so forth. You can back yourself out of a jam. You are mentioned in Jimmy Buffett's autobiographical book, A Pirate Looks at 50. He talks about the song 12 Volt Man, and he also talks about trying to make the movie version of Margaritaville with you. Yeah. When I mention Jimmy Buffett, what goes through your mind? Well, it's all good. I mean, Jimmy is a spark, you know, and a sparkler. And he's just, uh, uh, there's something about his mane and his countenance that's just so positive and so uh, good. It's the reason that (laughs) Margaritaville is not a sloppy drunk song where you're laying you know, passed out on a lawn somewhere. It's a, it's more of a, of a expression of the life of the song and, and the fun that you can have when you're in those sorts of environments. And Jimmy lives it. He lives it. He expresses it. You know, he's a, he's a bare, a barefoot boy, I mean, you know, barefoot billionaire now, but during the time we were working together, he was, he and I were just, you know, knocking around seeing what we could find. And uh, another guy who was a little bit part of that was Harrison Ford, just because he was a good friend of Jimmy's and mine's. And he was always up to something interesting, is always up to something interesting. But the thing that drove it along, it being Margaritaville, was just uh, Jimmy's winsome and open lifestyle, which I learned a lot from. I mean, he was, uh, you know, didn't, uh, didn't sweat the small stuff. The only guy who I ever knew that worried less than Jimmy Buffett was uh, Jack Nicholson. And um, th- these are not parades of, of names to drop. This, these are really people who are living the life and you know it because, oh, that is Jimmy Buffett. Oh, that is Jack Nicholson. And once you get next to these guys, you realize it's they're special. There's something going on in their head that does not go on in uh, the mind of a, uh, of a journeyman. On that note, you mentioned these names like Jack Nicholson. Are you ever starstruck around anybody? No, but I got a great starstruck story. I'm I'm all through with starstruck now. (laughs) As far as I can tell, I might I might swoon at a you know state leader or something like that. The story is that I was uh, riding my motorcycle from. Carmel, Monterey, which is where I live, down to Los Angeles to do some work and <clears throat> pull off to uh, get some gas. And there's a, a rent car, Buick, with a couple of kids in the back seat, and probably in there, you know, just post pubescent. And, and uh, the guy who is uh, looking to get gas in the car is fluttering around, fumbling around. And I'm just sort of watching that. I've don't have as much work to do as he does because I'm on a motorcycle, but he's he's finding where the caps go, and you know it looks like he's working harder than he should work to put gas in the car. But he doesn't seem flustered by it at all. He seems kind of easy going. And then I look at him, and it dawns on me: wait a minute, this guy's a little too good looking. <laughs> What's going on with him? He is this this guy looks like a movie star. And then I do a long take without embarrassing him. And I realized, oh, my God, it is a movie star. That's Mel Gibson. <laughs> so at that moment, I was starstruck. And I thought, well, how do I handle this? <laughs> this is new. And I said, I said, aren't you Mel Gibson? And he said, yes, I am. I said, oh, my gosh, 
well, it's nice to meet you. I'm Michael Nesmith. Uh, and then for some reason that to this day I can't explain, and I emphasize when I tell the story at dinner parties, I got this feeling of insecurity and feeling like I've got to validate myself to this man, you know. And so I started, I started listing all of my credits. I started saying, I, I, you, you know, I was one of the monkeys. And he, he kind of looks at me flatlined. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, I, and I, wrote some, I wrote some nice songs. I'm a writer. Uh, I wrote, and, then, and I started dropping these credit bombs. And I thought, Nesmith, shut up. <laughs> you know, this, this guy. And he says, right about that time, with a twinkle, he says, <laughs> and to my blessed relief, he says, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so that let it loose. And then I, I was able to say in a really normalized tone, well, what are you doing out here? Because we were off on the middle of the, nowhere. We were out by the coast and a long way from decent roads. And <clears throat> he said, well, I think I'm lost. And I said, well, where are you trying to get to? He said, I'm trying to get to Santa Barbara. I said, oh, you are lost. Uh, this is not the way to do that. You, uh, what I can do is I can lead you back to a road that you can take that you won't encounter what you would encounter if you tried to travel across these hills. So let me do that. And he said, okay, that sounds great. So we suited up. I suited up. He was in his perfect little living room Buick, and I was in my uh, my anteroom motorcycle. And off we trundled uh, down towards Santa Barbara and where he was going to meet with some pe- friends for dinner and so forth. We pulled up towards the end of the little journey, and I I said, it's really great to meet you. I hope our paths cross again sometime. I admire your work, because I am. I'm a big fan of uh, the uh, first uh, Road Warrior movie. And I think, uh, you know, you've got something going on here. I should say the second Road Warrior movie, that's the one. And so, you know, it's been a real pleasure to make your acquaintance and to lead you out of the woods on a motorcycle. It's just a good story. And we both laughed and he's off into the woods or off into the night. And I am too. Next night I'm uh, watching television. I think I'm wa- watching Carson. I was going at the time and on the show, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mel Gibson. Uh, wait a minute. And I start watching the show and, and Johnny Carson asks him the $64 question. Mel, have you ever been starstruck? <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is amazing. And he says, you know, I really never have except one time. <laughs> and he said, and he tells the story of meeting me at this gas station. Oh, man. <laughs> and how he, yeah, it was great. It was a moment that I thought, really, he was, he was in that headspace and I have to say that from time to time in in concerts and what have you, I'll sense that somebody has gotten on the page with me, and it's a dance. Although I don't exactly know who it is. They're faceless, and I don't, you know, they're not my girlfriends, and they're not my boyfriends. They're not any, you know, I don't know them at all, except I start to share a moment like the uh, Gibson saying, yeah, I was only ever starstruck with Nesmith, and... uh, and it's it 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 fulfills whatever is in me that doesn't have that very much. And when you you get you hang out with the in the halls of power and with the people who work in it, and and uh, you you start to realize, oh, these are the guys. These are the people who really do the stuff that you're trying to do, and they're doing it. But they're not using poetry. They're using weapons of war, and you know coercion and the stuff that they use. And when you get around people with that kind of what you, what you suppose is power, you do get a little, what's the word? You get a little humbled. You get a little sheepish. You, you think to yourself, well, you know, here we go. But that's always worked out for me. I've never been into a place where you say, oh my God, I loved your last kazoo record where, you know, I had no idea you could play, anybody could ever play a kazoo like that. Why, what was, was that Bach? And, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's, absurd. it goes absurd. But when you have a moment like, uh, uh Mel and I did, it, it doesn't go absurd. It, it stays as a little, as a little treasured Cohen. <laughs> what a cool story. 
Thanks. What is the best thing about being Nez? Freedom, I think, is freedom. That's the one thing. It's also, with that freedom comes an ability to uh, to see through the problems and the troubles and the difficulties and and you're you get on a you get on a kind of wavelength with other people that is enhanced by being free to do it and that's that's one of the things that ha- having chosen a life in the arts has provided for me and every artist i know who are you know world famous or not famous all have this same kind of sense of let's go do it we can do it if we want to we're that's who we are <laughs> And I like that. You know, that's great to have among friends. It's a it's a joie de vivre, and it's a freewheeling kind of sensibility. Then I think uh, so much comes out of the work that I'm doing upon those moments. I always like to give the guest to the stage at the end. Not just limited to music. For anyone who's tuned in, what would you say to them? Ah, well, you know, that's a, it's not a trick question because it's not, but I, it's a, it's a hard question because those are, those turn into sermons. You know, I would, I would tell Donna, don't be so afraid. And I would tell, uh, you know, sorry, don't be so bossy. And I would say, you know, things like that because they're very individual but in in the in, just to come up and say here's a generalized message for people who might be suffering from everything from the loss of a child to the loss of a job is I, I think it's fatuous it would be fatuous of me to try it and vapid in any in anything I say you know don't don't cry everything will be okay tomorrow these are what I, songs I call from the idiot wind and uh, <laughs> you, you know it's you you get these. Uh, it's maudlin kind of <laughs> terrible music and terrible poetry about just keep going until you see the light. I mean, it's not, you know, they're not, they're useless data sets and they're useless in terms of getting you out of a jam. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I've, I've got a, I've got a little guy that goes with me on stage that says, shut up. And um, he, he's got a very short, temper and and a way to deal with stuff that's coming coming in by just saying that very thing just shut up and sit down and sing the song you moron <laughs> and at that point that's my uh that's a real good um i don't know what you call them you call them uh you know somebody that's on the field with you saying don't run there run here <laughs> and those guys are, are with me you know every every time i play and i love it it's just it's a it's a great it's a great space to be in artistically who is michael nesmith how do you define uh-oh. yourself <laughs> uh-oh uh-oh i don't i know that may sound you know flip but it's it really isn't i've found that if i try to define who i am i define who i am not it's just one of the strange little quirks of mortality we tend to end up on the wrong side of who we are when we're trying to figure out who we are. Hmm. I mean, that's happened for me. I'm just telling, I'm just telling stories, you know, here out of school with you. I'm just, uh, and so I find out, well, then don't try to do that. Don't try to make yourself into something that you're not, or just try to spruce it up and, you know, put, put lipstick on a pig. You need to just let this un- unfold. And when I do that, the messages come and they're perfect. Here's, here's a, Here's a strange little example. It's a little off of what you asked. I gave the what may have been the worst concert of my life in where I think was uh, I think was Auckland, New Zealand, but it may have been Wellington. It was in New Zealand. That's about the most I know. And I was so disoriented, like you get on the road and so forth, and I didn't quite understand where I was or how I was doing it. But I knew that the shows take care of themselves, so I was just on on for the ride and. And I thought, look, you've done bad shows before. And if you have a bad show, it's not going to kill you. So just, you know, do what you can do. Try to set it right. And if it won't come right without some sort of serious meddling, then just get off the stage. <laughs> so all those things were at work. And, and I had this 
at the time, end of the show, the audience was lackluster and I was lackluster and I almost felt like I wanted to give everybody's money back and apologize because <laughs> that actually happens to you on stage. You stand up there and think, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it happens rare enough so that it still makes it, you want to go out and do it. But I was feeling really bad when I came off stage. I was like, man, that's the worst show I may have ever done in my entire life. And I get into the car, and I got a little short drive to the next town. I'm not sure where it is, but it's one of the bigger towns in uh, New Zealand. And uh, I get in, I, I go to bed, wake up the next morning, go on about my breakfast programs and looking at stuff to do and to think about. And uh, this uh, idea comes into my head. It's like, you know, you can't have a bona fide career if you keep singing songs like that and singing them in that way. That was, a, you know, you were you were a jerk to your crowd and they, they were shocked and un, unhappy with you and don't ever do that again because that was all just, you know, self-centered and a sense of self and a thing of, of who you are that you don't want to bring on stage. That's not who people are coming to see. People are coming to see the work. So... I'm in the middle of uh, getting deeper and deeper into kind of a moroseness. And I look up in another breakfast joint. This woman is approaching, as I have come to understand, to be uh, you know, a, a legitimate approach. And she says, oh, my God, you're Mike, you're Mike Nesmith. And I said, yes, I am. Uh, how do you know me? And she said, well, she said, I have to tell you, I was at your show last night in Hamilton. And I have to tell you, it was one of the greatest shows I ever saw in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, I can't laugh in her face. <laughs> and I said, oh, that is so nice of you to say that. I was sitting here thinking about this show and wondering if that's going to be, you know, my death now or some horrible <laughs> crime I've committed against my fellow man. And sure enough, here you come up and you make it all go right. So there's a nice long laugh at that moment. But what the message was for me was, you don't ever know, Nez. You never know the kind of uh, effect you're having. So don't just assume that you do. Hmm. Just do the work and let it lay out there. And if it's made a connection, somebody will tell you, just like this nice lady from Hamilton <laughs> who tells you she's now seen the greatest show she ever saw. So, And I understand what she's saying because when the, when the show works – there are moments of remembrance. There's moments of times past, of times to come that all settle in. They just nestle into the basket like a happy day. And and so I learned to trust that, and I learned not to put uh, messages on anything. The songs carry what they carry within them, and I'm just, uh, you know, at that point, I'm just the messenger. Well, Nez... You're a pleasure to interview. Thank you very much for this experience. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for calling and putting me on the boards. And uh, are you coming to the shows or a show? I hope to get to a show at some point soon, but I'm I'm on the other side. Of, I, I wish I could be in California. <laughs> uh, where are you? Atlanta? Yeah. Yes, sir. In Atlanta. Yeah. Well. I don't think I'm going to get there, but you never know. And if if so, I'm sure you you're on the list now, so you'll know about it. Uh -huh. but it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for the questions. They were uh, they were uh, important and and insightful, and uh, I think you did a good job. Well, thank you, sir. For all the listeners, it's Video Ranch 3 dcom Yeah, we'll see you in there. <laughs> all right, sir. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Zapapi, papapa, do nak jiba, loop di kizan, de guzi, a te kasa ge kalaka pina, se ge de bo che ge ye, ki pon, ki kaka di kitukon, ki di ton, ki put, be like a tour, ze kon, de le vangara, ke tu, goodbye.